Hi everyone, my name's Rebecca and I'm a ichthyologist, a fish biologist and I'm also a PhD student studying um, the evolution of laurel curled catfishes which are plecos. So this video is going to be on Lepvocanthus and Scobin and Cistrus. So it might seem a bit strange why I've included these two genera together. And this is because in this series I'm focusing on diet and I really feel it would be a waste of time to do a video on each. I have done a video on Leprocanthus in the past anyway. So these are two very striking genera. Both come in a variety of sizes, um, more towards the larger size um, in comparison to what most of them are in the trade. Um, but the largest being Scobin and Cistrus, where the Sunshine or Goldie Pleco, um, Scobin and Cistrus aureatus, many undescribed species, um, and the majority of the genus anyway, tops about 30 centimetres standard length. Although Scobin and Cistrus does have a smaller undescribed um, species known as L82. Uh, which only grows to around 20 centimetres standard length. Leprocanthus, on the other hand, ranges um, more towards that lower level of um, around 15 centimetre standard length uh, with Leprocanthus josemi, which is the Sultan Pleco, to around 24 centimetre standard length or much larger for the Galaxy Plecos, which is Leprocanthus galaxius. Um, and they have a variety of L numbers such as L007 and L240. Um, so it's got quite a few L numbers that galaxies because potentially they're not all actually galaxious. Um, and Leprocanthus as a genus is often referred to as the vampire pleco and why I'll get into in a bit. Um, they're both reasonably elongate, um, a bit bulky I guess because they're not flat or really skinny like some Lord Carne or even the many flat um, Hypostomine. Um, they tend to have a more elongate head um, compared to some but not extreme. Let the canthicus though is easy diagnosed. It does have that more triangular long head um, but it's diagnosed with a hook at the back of the head around the nuchal region. It does have that elongated snout and their suction um, pads, their suction um, cup is a little bit more elongate but you find that I think with scoping and cistrus as well. And a lot of carnivores tend to have this, or true carnivores, um, also like Pseudocanthicus. Scobin and Citrus is maybe a bit more broad um, and not too deep. These tend to be really like colourful, um, or the striking like uh, colours of uh, Leprocanthicus galaxius and a few Scobin and Citrus with that sort of dark base colour with white spots. Um, even reticulations on the abdo abdominal region. Scobin and Citrus, which is that lovely grey um, colour and also the spotting. There's quite a lot of variation. Obviously Scobin and Citrus aureatus is the one that really gets people because they are what you kind of want in barren Citrus, but they don't lose those seams really. So what do these fishes eat? These fishes are true carnivores, feeding on insect invertebrates, which isn't entirely common in Laurel Cardae, unlike what a lot of people would think, um, that to have be a true carnivore. But um, what they both share is they're actually both molluscivores as well, which um, they're feeding on mollusks, so um, snails, um, Snails are slow. Well, I was assume it's mostly gastropods, um, but there's ne it never gets specified for further than it being a mollusk, uh, which is a massive category. Um, these so feed on snails and other mollusks. Along with this, they will eat a variety of insect larvae. So here we have uh, Leprocanthicus, 
um, Joe's and my, I think. And you can see that these fish are pretty mature and they're only tiny compared to some of the other sort of Leprechanthicus and many of the other carnivores. But again, uh, we can look at some of those, um, the head anatomy that differs really from the herbivores. When you looked at Bear and the Cistus, if you watch my previous video, it's a lot more broad. These fishes are, those fishes aren't going in crevices. These guys, but these guys potentially are to get their food. They really need to get in. Um, and you can see here that they have that really narrow head. So, oh, if I just, you can see it's really long. And that helps explain sort of, that's quite different from scoping than cistrus. And then also that hook, that really identifying factor, but you can also see that head shape is just really long. They're quite distinctive as a genus. Um, oh, why, what are you focusing on? There we go, and you can see that hook around that sort of nuchal region. But what we really need to look at when it comes to what these fish are eating and what they should be fed, we really want to look down below and look at these jaws. So here I have three and I was only going to do one and then I thought, you know what, this really shows the flexibility of these jaws. They have small tooth plates, not many teeth. These are carnivores, and not many teeth as in like next to none. Um, and this probably aids in them really, they don't want large tooth plates. If you're going to try and reach into something, you want sort of to be as small as possible just to get in that crevice because that's where that insect is that you really want. And they have these large suction cups large what well, hence the name vampire pleco they do have quite large or obvious barbels but a lot of lower cars do and also these sort of filaments to the um the suction cup which is a large suction cup anyway because obviously it's a carnival and you can see that sort of you can imagine this fish going into a crevice and reaching in um this one, I don't think this jaw is broken, it's just really wonky. Um, but you can imagine this fish is going into a crevice and it only needs a few long teeth just to reach and scrape it out. The rest of it, sort of, break it down will be done later on. Um, and it's not really going at a large surface, it just needs to be able to get into it. And I'd assume a lot of the breaking down will happen at other um aspects but they're not the fastest i think to actually they don't need to be fast to eat their food it's not actually really going away that quickly um you just need to be able to kill it and pin it down really and once it's pinned down it's got no escape but they are really unusual and it really contrasts when you've seen the barren sisters and even the panaculus that i've shown before that they this fish has very few teeth as like it's just so contrasted and this is true carnivores um the ones like hyper and citrus you could tell they're not really carnivores they're detritivores and just by looking at the contrast in the teeth they're nothing like this um it's really difficult to focus but you can see that real difference in anatomy not many little cards you're going to be able to see them feed just like that by turning them to the side to see this angle of the jaws. So how can this be replicated in the wild? Um, in captivity, sorry. So in captivity, I find these probably the most easy to do. Um, obviously you've got like Rapashi grub pie, Rapashi bottom scratch, which is good to get sort of vitamins and minerals. But other than that, I would say getting snails into their diet would be brilliant and also enrichment. You can buy apple snails frozen um, and deshelled. You could also get uh, escargot snails. I'd recommend maybe washing them because they are usually treated with salt. So rinsing them would be a good idea. 
and we'll leave them soak for a little period of time. And then there's other ways of getting sales, maybe African land sales. Um, the difficulty is they tend to float a lot of them. Even like apple snails, they breed like crazy. So they would be some sort of enrichment and they're all, they're found in South America as well. If they could get through that trapdoor is another thing altogether, but they have really adapted for um, getting into cracks, crevices and also mollusks. Um, and then look at other invertebrates. So you've got the whole selection of frozen food out there and really varying it, just different ones. Trying shrimp, you can try neocardinia, mono shrimp would be a bit tad pricey, but there's always river shrimp. Um, although river shrimp, they are brackish, they might not make it by the time the lower card gets to them. But a variety of different invertebrates, insects, and even you don't even have to be restricted to the fish store because a lot of fish stores might not have the variety of frozen foods that you'll be after. I would recommend trying to go for like tube effects, limit it, you don't, don't rely on blood one, but maybe a little bit, um, brine shrimp, artemia, same thing, daphnia, cyclops might be a tad small, but it's something for them to feed on, and you can offer enrichment by putting it in the substrate, making them have to work for that food, it would be better with live foods, then you've got black worms, uh, white worms, um, there's other well, frozen foods. Uh, oh, what's that one? Cockles. I would avoid, obviously, I've done a video on diaminase, but I'd avoid mussels, prawns, or just limiting them entirely. They aren't just um, high in diaminase, which destroys vitamin B1 um, thiamine in the fish. Um, they're also deficient in it, so they're going to need a lot of um, sort of something to boost those levels of vitamin B1 back up just because you fed mussels or um, or prawns and there's other fish that do contain that as well as other invertebrates um, and I wouldn't feed them fish because they are insectivores, molluscivores so they're not going to be feeding on fish and they won't be adapted to extract that nutrition from the fish so I would focus on looking at um, just a variety of insects and don't be limited by the fish stores because reptiles, you could try like to be a roaches, it's, getting them to sink uh, would be a challenge. Earthworms are brilliant actually and they don't need to be dead, they could be alive and these fish will feed on them. Other than earthworms to be a roaches, you could try crickets, um, locusts, it's getting them to sink. So. Um, there's quite a few like new things of like packeted it up um, reptile foods I've seen, but I don't know whether they contain anything that will get in the water column. Um and citrus is quite big, so you'd need a big tank anyway for um, the majority of them. So that does help disperse anything they come those um, insects would come with. But just think out of the box maybe and. There's so much variety, unlike for herbivores, that you could get for them that would help replicate that wild diet. Another aspect of it is a lot of people do experience bloat in Leprocanthus and they do go for plants to replicate this. Now I think this is largely because a lot of diets that are aimed at carnivores are large in fish meal, krill meal even, um, insect meal but mostly that fish meal they might they'd be heavily processed and I think there is that benefit in that fish having to um, consume large amounts of chitin and yes krill does contain chitin and obviously insects do but trying like diets that or trying addition to diets like those insects those frozen foods that have that whole chitin that is going to be larger chunks, they're going to help sort of break down other food or it, oh, I don't know if it would act as a level of fibre but it would be like useful to do because that's what they're eating in the world, they're not eating algae and they're not eating plants and they're not eating bacteria really, they might touch a sponge but I doubt they have the teeth much for it so anyway, I 
think I've gone through this topic. Um, thank you for watching. If you like my videos, please comment, like, subscribe. Um, and if you can suggest Genra that you'd be interested in learning about their diets, I can do more. Um, I just want to know what people are interested about. Obviously, I do have that video on Hypen Sisters and also on um, Panax, Panaculus, and um, Hypossimus Cotchidon, Lassian Sisters, Ten Tentaculatus, and also it does cover Peccatia, Ichthys, Bacchi, Bacchi. Um, which is also the ones that utilise wood for detritivore. Anyway, thank you for watching and goodbye.